Hi, welcome back to the show. It's I, your host, Agostino Zinga, and this is the Agostino Zinga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zinga, and this is episode number 514. How are you doing? Great. How's the family? Amazing. How am I? Doing better than ever, trying to put one foot in front of the other, and dr- just, just, just about trying to keep myself alive. That's all I can do. That's all I can hope for. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below if you love what you're seeing. You want to give me some feedback or whatever, that'd be greatly appreciated. If you listen via the podcast app, or specifically, specifically, the Apple Podcast app, please leave me a 54321 star review. I don't care which one it is, just leave me some review. I've seen some really good ones on there. Please keep them up. I'm really happy that you're putting some reviews on there and people are be able to see that people do actually listen to this thing and it's not just me rambling into the void because that would be very sad. Apart from that, nothing else to promote really. I'm just back here in the saddle talking to you and ready to go, willing and able to drive forward and do the things that we need to do. We've got a jam-packed show to you today. Jam, jam jam-packed show. Loads of stuff to get into. I don't want to waste any more of your precious time. So we're just going to jump right into it, innit? How you doing, man? How's life? Hope you're good wherever this is meeting you. I am doing pretty fine, as you can tell. I've had the man makeup routine done, right? I got the fade done, fresh fade, fresh beard trim. I put on a bit of cocoa bar. I'm feeling like a million bucks right now. No one can tell me anything. Right now, in this scenario, at this very moment, no one can tell me a single thing. I think I look like some six foot four, light skinned guy with green eyes and shit, six pack with a wham chest. That's how I feel right now. You know what I mean, you can't tell me any different. Um, you cannot tell me any different. So I'm feeling good, feeling myself, feeling um, somewhat grateful to be alive, somewhat grateful to be in this odd position that we're in at the moment where, you know, like I mentioned in another pod, it just, there is something very strange these days about going outdoors partying raving having a well of a time knowing full well that there are other people in the world who are hurting in ways that you can't even imagine during the pandemic do you know what i mean they're still suffering um they still got you know people in their family who have maybe passed away people in their family who are maybe at death's door just some really dark dark stuff but we just have to keep going in it it's just a strange place to be you just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and i think that's just is the name of the game there's nothing more that needs to be said about those kind of things but you know it is what it is so that's where we are in this situation and i've been thinking somewhat a little bit about not thinking a lot about i've been thinking a bit about the, my kind of evolution as a human and what I want a human or as a human being and what I sort of want to personify, represent, be about sometime in the future, right? There is something that I kind of want to change about myself. And I think one of the main things I want to change in myself and one of the main things that kind of sometimes keeps me up at night is my lack of, I would say, congruency with how I present myself in public or how I present myself in public and how, how I am in private, right? I get up to some some dark shit. I get some bad stuff behind closed doors, right? Stuff that I'm not willing to say out loud and obviously stuff that if it came out, I'd be embarrassed about. So I want to get to a point where I can align the way that I present myself and the things that I get up to behind closed doors so they're one and the same. So that however I am behind closed doors, exactly how I am in front of the world, so that if anything did come up about me, I would never be embarrassed and I would never feel like, you know, I put myself out, look, I kind of, you know, embarrassed my family or whatever. You know, kind of thing. I wouldn't want to do that sort of thing. So I'm trying to get to that point and I'm trying to get to a point where I um, c- can be described as an honourable person, as a trustworthy person as a stand-up guy, right? That's kind of what I want to be kind of known for. I think, especially after noticing the kind of shift in the party scene and also noticing my sort of shift in how I want to kind of be viewed in that world and not necessarily caring that much about it, that no, not really caring about that side of things anymore. Obviously, I care about the playing, like I said. My kind of dream going forward would be to, you know, have at least, how would you say, um, what's the equivalent? let's say like 60 is it 60 gigs how many months is in a year there's 12 months in a year um let's calculate this quickly let's calculate so i'm give you a little little duh, 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 duh. how many weekends in a year 52 so let's say my dream scenario would be to play somewhere to be like a dj that plays 30 to 40 weekends in a year 
which obviously gives you a nice time to kind of you know be about your family hang out with your friends and stuff so it's not all all encompassing um obviously have my own studio designing creating consulting making magazines doing photo shoots making you know small selections of merch or little capsule collections consulting on this consulting on that strategic planning communication all that good stuff that i've done maybe a little contemporary art studio in the corner to kind of pick up the stuff that i obviously studied in school and whatnot a little design practice but stuff something that would basically give me a rich and fulfilling life right I have to kind of explore all of my interests and obviously that will include DJing, right? So let's say to 30 to 40 weekends per year, I'd be out playing some some places. But that will be playing in some of the best clubs in the world, being surrounded by people who actually love the music and are about that this life for real, and not just being surrounded by people that just want to get out and cane it. Because I was that person one time too, but I'm kind of over it. I'm not really, you know what I mean? I, I kind of go out specifically to kind of listen to tunes, listen to music, hear DJs play, you know get the ambiance of people especially after being in a pandemic i just love being around strangers these days that's just cool i just like being in the midst of things standing right in the front being around strangers just kind of bopping from side to side closing your eyes it feels amazing it's better than any drug i honestly i honestly do believe it and i've ingested a lot of stuff so i would know but i want to get to a point where i'm just regarded as a good dude i think that's what i kind of want to get to that's what because there was a point in my life where i really wanted to be cool I wanted to be referred to as like a cool guy. So I got into cool things. I tried to talk about cool stuff. I tried to surround myself with cool people. And it was a very empty life. I'm not going to lie. Um, the people in that sort of scene, you know, they, it, it doesn't really go far for me. Again, it's nothing. It's not like a slight on them at all. I think people who kind of are still about in that world are people that I still know. And they still hang around in that sort of quote unquote scene. And they still kind of give themselves up to the life of going to private views and getting free drinks and trying to scam goodie bags and just trying to be like a friend of a friend of everyone so you can get links to this and for sure it does work for a certain type of person but for me I just couldn't do it and like I said before in other podcasts I've come I came into this sort of like whatever you'd call it this kind of modern day renaissance man lifestyle whatever this thing is right where you're interested in like music nightlife you know um hospitality uh holidaying vacationing you know, whatever sports da, 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 this whole world i came into it kind of idolizing the pioneers right idolizing the people that founded places like paradise garage and studio 54 and burke kind of police place like that right i kind of wanted to emulate that in my own sort of way instead of just being the person that just wanted to be the club kid yeah i, I always wanted to be a little bit more than that now it's not to slight on that it's not to kind of say denigrate people who want to be club kids but that was never my game so once you get into it and you discover everyone just wants to be cool and no one wants to do the work, you start realizing, okay, cool. Let me just step aside a bit or step back a bit to focus on the work and I'll get to where I need to get to. Now, that journey is far longer to get where you want to get to. If you want to just do the work, it just take, it does take a longer time. I have to admit, sucking up and licking people's ass does actually work if you're good at it. But I think it's more worthwhile. And again, the, the next step from that is to just be a genuinely cool guy, a generally, a generally good dude to everyone not just the people in the scene, people like, you know, in everyday life, so that if I do end up passing some time, you know, people are will actually miss me. People will actually think, oh no, that guy was actually a decent person. He contributed something to society. You know, he did this and this for me. He gave me this insight, that insight, whatever it may be. I just want to be that. I just want to leave a good sort of, um, I want to leave some sort of good reverberations with people. So, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to tackle it. I'm probably going to have to read a lot of Nietzsche and do a lot of introspection. I'm probably going to have to do a lot of kind of self inventory to figure out the bits about me that I don't like and try and make an active change to rectify those parts of me that I don't like and try and be a better person going forward. And again, all these things are super boring. Um, they're super, you know, uneventful. They're super like they, they don't really mean anything to anybody apart from myself. No one sees all this hard work I'm going to do on my own to kind of get right and become a better person. No one essentially will care apart from me, but I do think I would be a better family member, a better friend, a better whatever um if I'm able to do that sort of thing going forward. Definitely because I don't think the other lifestyle is for me anymore. It really isn't. It never was, but I think especially since we've come out of the pandemic and I've been able to come back outside, pop my head out, be in different spaces, I realized, you know what? I never really enjoyed this thing. 
Um, I always enjoyed it for being the practitioner. I always wanted to be the person behind the decks, the person organizing the event, all these kind of things. I never wanted to just be the person just in the crowd, just like, you know, bobbing and trying to get into the green rooms and, you know, get behind DJ booths. I don't really care like that. I want to be, I want to either like be a consumer and have fun or I want to be a person kind of, the person actually putting the thing on and just being in the background but I don't want to be this weird in between where you're sort of like wanting to stand next to people so people think you're doing something when you're not I always thought that sort of stuff was kind of lame personally anyway I just thought it was all kind of lame so that's the place I kind of want to be at the moment again it's going to be difficult it's going to be tough I'm sure it's not going to be an easy smooth ride but I'm going to try my best to make that happen because what's what else can I do you know what I mean what, what what else is there to do in life apart from that I think I mentioned before in another podcast that I slowly but surely came to the realization that for the most part life is you know the majority of life is suffering if it, if that is true you're going to have to kind of work really hard to create some little specks of sunlight and glitter and happiness in your life that you're going to look back on and think, oh, that was well worth it. Do you know what I mean? And um, it's difficult to do, but it's worthwhile in the long run. I hope so. Anyway, that's my kind of aim going forward. That's my aim going forward. But apart from that, what else have I been up to? I've been watching a lot of Man United play, obviously. We played over the weekend and it was a terrible, you know, over the weekend. The other day, actually, yesterday, um, what am I talking about? I'm um, in a Champions League, drew 2-2 away from home against Atalanta. And um, yeah, man, this game, once again, when you've Manchester United, every match that we play, ask more questions than answering questions, right? More questions are asked than answered. Always happens. Um, I think the underlying um, sort of message needs to be for most people, or the underlying sort of, thing that I take away from all our performances is that no matter what we do no matter what the result is for me it always feels like a kind of confirmation that Oli is not the guy and that the Gladys are doing are doing a lot of harm at our club overall we've always known that but in terms of our lack of kind of footballing direction the lack of football people in the club making the football decisions the lack of planning the lack of foresight that's really hampering us in a way that we probably have never understood until this very moment because the Oligan social stuff as you guys know you know there was rumors about him maybe getting sacked after we got beat 5-0 from at home that's all you have to imagine right imagine being the top club and you get beaten by one of your closest rivals that way usually those kind of matches are sackable offenses like you're just not allowed to lose a game against your bitter rivals 10-0 it's just not it's, it's not even worth even i think it's such an unlikely scenario that sometimes clubs don't even bother even putting it into your contract they just know that they already know that if you do that you're going to fall on your own sword right that sort of thing but it happened we lose 5-0 Usually at top elite clubs, those are kind of sackable offences. It usually doesn't only stop with the manager. Usually those offences can kind of result in players getting frozen out of teams and getting let go later on in the summer. Like that's a big, big offences. It didn't happen. Nothing happened. We kept him. Now, again, extenuating circumstances, it's not all just as simple as that. Oli obviously is mostly in a job because there's not really any viable options out there. As great as Conte would have been, I am, I'm not a believer that he would have been the perfect fit for United of course he would have definitely won stuff he would have definitely come in and demanding things and maybe kind of shook the club up a bit but I think considering the PTSD the club I've got from Van Gaal and from Mourinho's tenure it was very optimistic for us to ever consider or ever believe that the club was ever going to be in for Conte I don't think that was going to be true um, Oli would have had to push them to the brink for that to have happened and look look what happened we lost 5-0 and that still wasn't enough for them to, to pull the trigger so I don't think us finishing 10th will even be enough to get Conte a job and obviously now he can't because he's at, to at Tottenham but I don't think I was ever on the card so that obviously helped Oli's chances of staying in the job there's no real viable options all the available coaches that we'd want are already at different clubs or the ones that we do or one of them in Zidane has allegedly turned the job down which is another story for another day so that happens and then it seems like every game since then has just has just basically confirmed everyone's suspicions or everyone's fears that Oli is not the guy going forward and I think the sad thing is about it is that for the people that are fans of his they've seen all the good he's done quote unquote which is a bit exaggerated but let's imagine they've seen all the good he's done and they can't probably wrap their head around accepting the idea that he's not gonna be able to finish his job he's not gonna be able to finish it he's not gonna be able to see the rewards of it or he's not gonna be able to kind of reap the rewards of it for the most part he'll obviously see it um, he's not gonna be able to reap the rewards of it and for them it's very frustrating and they're just hoping 
it just is pure hope. It's not really out anything else. It's just more hope that he just turns it around. And I don't think that's going to happen. In the same way how this team keeps pulling out results because we've got world-class players, I think that eventually stops. In the same way, Oli's luck will eventually run out and he will eventually be sacked. It just is what it is. What can you do? The game itself, I thought, was, again, fairly indicative of how we've been over the last couple of seasons. Um, or maybe the last um, season and a half, probably, I would say, under Oli's tenure. We don't necessarily seem to have a way of playing that kind of brings out the best in our players. We sort of look like we play freestyle football. We have a formation that we're playing now, obviously, with five at the back. That's obviously a response to what happened at Liverpool. We got a good result away from home at Tottenham. You know, one thing about Oli, if you find something that works, you're just going to repeat it again and again and again. I think we played that fucking 4 3 3 formation or that 4 2 3 or that 4 2 1. Three, one, whatever formation or two, or whatever that formation was, 37 games in a row or something, right? So Oli is not the guy that's going to change up systems all of a sudden. So it was always going to be evident he was going to play that formation again against um, Atalanta away from home. And I was one of the only people that thought that it was a good formation. It was a good team selection. I thought considering our, per, our kind of precarious, eh, precarious um position in the table, especially in the Europa League, sorry, in the Champions League Europa League, God, my fraudulent slip, we needed to win this game more than we needed a strong performance. Odd to say, but we did. We just needed to win this game more likely than not than have a strong performance. And again, we didn't win. We drew the game. So again, it goes to show what I know about football. But I didn't really mind the formation. If anything, I was kind of questioning the inclusion of a Shaw there. I thought a Tellers would have been a far better option as a left wing back. I just think Shaw is finished. I don't think he's good enough for this level. He's been playing within himself for seven seasons. He had one purple patch last season playing somewhat okay. And people thought he turned the corner, but he hasn't. He's always kind of struck me as a player that plays within himself. Doesn't necessarily, I wouldn't say even believes in himself. He just seems lazy. He just seems unmotivated. And maybe again, it's, it's not really his fault because he spent seven years at one of the top clubs in the world with no real competition to his spot, apart from last season when Alec Teres signed. So maybe we've kind of allowed him to feel this sort of um, level of comfortness over the years and we've only got ourselves to blame. But I was surprised at his inclusion. But the rest of the team, I thought, picked itself. I thought it was a fairly decent team. If anything, I was thinking maybe Varane could have got a rest. But hey, we move. We start the game off. Atalanta start off very strong. They can, they're obviously keep, keeping the ball much better than we are, despite us having, you know, so, so many players. They're kind of cutting through us in the midfield, even though we have a midfield stack of bodies. We got many players behind the ball and it just felt like another kind of deja vu sort of moment was going to happen and of course they scored first um a really well taken goal by Illich I thought especially in terms of how he basically shoots I thought a lot of people made a lot of big deal about Zapata who obviously played really well against us but I've always kind of thought Joseph Illich is definitely Atlanta's kind of danger man he's very kind of um crafty can score all kind of goals you know goals outside the area in the box headers very creative player, very underrated. Um, again, De Gea maybe could have saved it better because it kind of went underneath his body. But again, I think he was a bit unsighted and he saw it really late. And by the time he saw it, he already dived over it and it went in. Um, then, of course, Christian Ronaldo, the main man, ends up scoring an equaliser. Probably our best team goal I've seen maybe since the Bruno Fernandes at Newcastle one. Is it Was that from last season when it was raining? That goal was sensational, that counter-attack. But this was a really great team goal. But again, watch the replay again. There's a lot of stuttering and stammering, but there's a lot of kind of understanding between the better players up front as soon as the better players get it further forward up the pitch they just figure out how to kind of make something happen that's what you saw with that goal and again another evidence that we don't necessarily practice patterns of play like we don't necessarily have like those kind of goals that Newcastle away from home and that kind of that kind of goal we saw from Ronaldo they should be textbook Ronaldo, they should be textbook sorry Man United goals right you think of that um, magical goal between Dwight and York. Is it uh, Andy Cole and Dwight York? Is it against Barcelona? Away from home, where they kind of ping it back and forward, one two, one two, and it gets popped through and he pops over the keeper. Is that Barcelona? I think it was Barcelona wearing a white kit. But anyway, those kind of goals should be classic or standard Man United goals, right? If you're going to talk about Man United DNA, those should be the Man United goals, but we don't score those type of goals. We just score freestyle type of goals. So whatever. Moving on, second half, obviously, we start off shaky again. Harry Maguire is having an absolute stinker. By is rescuing him out of time after time. Um, Zapata scores a very well-taken goal. Ball over the top. It felt like they purposely tried to get 
Zapata to kind of effectively be one on one with Bai in the hope that he'd outmuscle him. And then if he had to go and beat, and, he, and if he had to go and career down the goal, the only person he had to kind of meet was Maguire, who didn't have the recovery pace to basically match uh, Zapata's speed and his strength and all that sort of stuff. I thought I think that's what the strategy was because it did work really well in that first goal. But he kind of got pulled out. He didn't really see his man. Zapata pops in behind, and Maguire is just moving like a track, like a tractor, basically trying to get across. He doesn't. That takes the goal really well. Offside rule for whatever reason takes ages to roll it onside. It's onside. Now obviously we think we're losing again. And then out, out of the blue, out of nowhere, towards the end of the game, um, Solskjaer basically brings on some of the better players, more technical players, especially out further up front. The likes of Van der Beek played with Ronnie came on. I thought Sancho stretched and kind of was a good option off the ball here and there. And then Ronaldo gets the ball outside the area and basically buries it in the bottom corner in a finish that, you know, only he can do, right? He's an unbelievable player, unbelievable um, goal machine, especially at this level, especially when you consider his age. So again, showing up the haters. But again, more questions than answers. Um, the Harry Maguire issue is a big one. I said when we signed him that it was a really bad deal in terms of the price tag. I had a lot of top reds, especially on, again, that United forum or Fred Tissue forum, whatever it may be, um, that I eventually ended up banning me because I was so anti Oli on that forum, which is funny. Um, they were very much kind of fans of Maguire. Um, saying that, you know, they, he was every bit as good as Van Dyke, saying the price tag doesn't matter, price tags are, are arbitrary, but they're not. Unfortunately, price tags are what they are in, in the in modern-day football. They do kind of act as some sort of a barometer of somebody's ability. You do kind of, you know, subconsciously or consciously um, compare players based on their price ranges or their kind of level of performance or their age, whatever it may be, right? That's what you kind of do rate some of the best players like. So if Maguire is worth 80 million, I don't even know what people like Virgil van Dijk is worth in this sort of market. Absolutely heinous. And we'd be lucky to get 50 million for him. Do you know what I mean, he's that bad. He's not, he's probably not the best defender at our club. For, forget centre back, just defender. He may be not the best defender at our club overall. And the thing that he suffers with a lot, which you're think seeing now, it's one thing for a defender to be slow, to not be quick off his feet, like just even the acceleration, or just be slow, you know, over 30 metres. But it's another thing to be dithering in your decision making when it comes to defending just looking all over the place when you have the ball just kind of basic things that you're like okay cool if you have some god-given things that you're just not good at that's one thing you maybe miss time tackles you maybe get a rush of blood like i said you may be too slow but when you just can't defend that's a real issue man that's a real 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 problem and for harry kane he's at that stage now at the moment where he's lucky he's got manager like ollie who kind of has faith in shit players. Um, that's another kind of reason I think as well, United are pitching in now because there is no consequence with some players. Some players there is. You know, Sancho can have one bad game and not play again for seven. You know, Fred McTominay, um, whatever favourites, Rashford, Ronaldo, Bruno Fernandes, these type of players, they can have terrible game after terrible game and nothing really happens. They don't, their position never gets, you know, it's never under threat. The next player available never gets a chance to play so i definitely do think that kind of leads to some deep-seated resentment or kind of um, skepticism about whether or not he's going to be successful because he's not really utilizing his squad well enough and then when the players do come in they're too cold they're not really integ well, integrated to the squad they have their own little kind of you know agendas or their things or things that they're holding on to it's just not the right way to go about things i don't think myself anyway going forward but hey Onwards and upwards, um, we have then now, uh, you know, a very important game against Man City coming up. I don't envision that being a good one for us, but, you know, stranger things have happened, innit? Stranger things have happened. Moving on, what else we got to talk about here? Oh, let's talk about this. this is really sad. Let's move on to this one. This is courtesy of NBC News. It says here, rapper Fetty Wap arrested by FBI on federal drug charges. Right, it's happened a few days ago. It says the artist, better known for his 2014 hit Trap Queen, pleaded not guilty and was ordered held without bail on Friday. Um, rapper Fetty Wap has arrested on Thursday night by FBI on a federal drug charge. Supposedly, he's arrested too at Rolling Loud. Another Rolling Loud victim. Supposedly, the feds over there in America, they have a real hard on for hip hop artists. And they seem to always wait for them to perform at Rolling Loud before they pick them up, which is some scumbag shit. That's some real evil shit. Again, I know some of these charges are not the best, right? Um, uh, one would argue, as DSP says, that maybe selling drugs to your community it's far worse than Rolling Loud ruining your one gig at a flipping festival somewhere. 
Because it, you know, you sh- I don't know, who knows? It continues. Faye Wap 30, whose real legal name was Willie Jr. Maxwell II, pleaded not guilty and was ordered to be held without bail at a virtual hearing on Friday. The Associated Press reported an attorney listed for him, Elizabeth Max Macedonia, did not immediately return requests for comment. According to a law enforcement official, the artist was arrested at City Fields in New York. Sorry, City Fields in Queens, where the Royal Lounge Festival was being held. Patterson, New Jersey rapper, is among half dozen people charged in the case. The other defendants were identified Friday as well as ever. The names are there. Um, they're all accused of running what prosecutors described as a multi-million dollar bi-coastal drug distribution organization with Suffolk County as their home base. County City District Attorney Anthony Sini said in a statement. According to an indictment, the organization ran more than from more, from about June 2019 to June 2020. The defendants obtained narcotics on the West Coast and used postal services and drivers with hidden vehicle compartments to transport the trucks to Suffolk County where they were stored um, according to a press released by the U.S. Attorney's Office. The drugs were then allegedly distributed to dealers who sold them on to Long Island, New Jersey. Five defendants are accused of using firearms to protect their organization and distribution chain. It says here, as an alleged, um, the defendants transported, distributed, and sold more than 100 kilograms of deadly and addictive drugs, including heroin, fentanyl, on Long Island. Isn't kilograms, isn't that like 100,000 grams? Right, isn't that? Is that hundred thousand? Like ten thousand grams? That's a lot of fucking drugs. Um, deliberately distrib- um, con- distributing, sorry, deliberately contributing to the opioid epidemic that has been devastating our communities. Oh no, he's gonna get buried. Um, taking too many lives, said Brian Pierce, U.S. Attorney for the East District of New York, in a statement. We will continue to work non-stop with our law enforcement and partners to keep the neighbourhoods safe. Um, search warrants um, executed during investigations recovered around 1.5 million in cash, 16 kilograms of cocaine, oh yeah, yeah, two kilograms of heroin, numerous fentanyl pills, two handguns, a rifle, a pistol, and ammunition. Sullivan was arrested on um, September 30th, while other defendants were taken into custody on October. Uh, they had to be charged with conspiring to distribute and possess controlled substances. If charged, the defendants face a maximum of life in prison. It's pretty mad, isn't it, that you get life in prison for selling drugs. But anyway, continue. We pray this is all not... What's that? Uh, a lawyer for Fetty Wap said, We pray this is all a misunderstanding, hoping he gets released so we can clear this up expeditiously. expeditiously. Um, attorneys uh, from other defendants who are listed... Uh, 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 Fetty Wap previously arrested in 2019. Yeah, cool. So again, what a massive fall from grace. This, is, this isn't too surprising, too, when you think about it. He had such a high peak... He ran, you know, what was that, two summers or one summer, whatever it was, when he was super, super hot. Then he kind of disappeared. Um, then it, we heard rumours about him not receiving his money from his label. Then, of course, there's evidence and stories that we know that he's got millions of kids everywhere. He's supposed to be a pretty decent dad by all accounts. Um, ma- many baby mothers, many mouths of feeds, big family to look after. Um, so it's no surprise that he's having to kind of lower himself allegedly to this sort of level in order to kind of make sure the bills are paid but again it's such a tragic represent such a tragic reflection on the music industry right that you can be as hot as he was for as long as he was or for that short period and you can still not make enough money Uh, again maybe a lot of it was wasted but it feels like there's never a there's never a big enough record that you can make that will allow you to live a life that's fairly comfortable. Or you have to maybe even negotiate a deal that allowed you to do so. Like the, that kind of, um, what's that OG Future deal they said that you got? It said, there's rumours around town that Future got some mad football numbers deal, right? Where he's just good for life, right? And obviously with his all his other deals that he does outside of that, I'm sure he does a lot of ghostwriting, all that sort of stuff, similar to like a Rick Ross. But unless you got one of those old school Birdman deals that he got back in the day, um, you don't you don't you don't see people making enough money out of music to allow them to be in a position where they can't effectively retire. Because if you listen to any of the recent Fetty Wap stuff that he recently put out, some of it's good, some of it's bad. But again, because no one cares about it and he's not probably getting any real time feedback, it's hard for him to create and understand what's going on in the zeitgeist. And because he's maybe you know a bit older, maybe he's kind of tapped out of the scene. He's not maybe as plugged in as he was before as well. He's also not being able to kind of synthesize the feeling in the air and make a tune that kind of captures it. He just can't do it at the moment. And yeah, man, it's just sad. It really, really is sad. I'm not going to lie to see a guy that created so many memorable moments, so many great tunes is now in a position where he's essentially 
destroying other people's lives by selling fentanyl pills, heroin, some of the most addictive and destructive drugs known in the history of man. It's just really sad to see, but god damn it, man. Rolling Loud just keeps picking up mad. Rolling Loud just keeps ruining people's lives, isn't it? From left to right. It just is one of those places. You just got to kind of mind your P's and Q's, isn't it? But yeah, um, free fat up, I guess, to some extent. Free him, I guess, to some extent, to some extent. Then continuing on from the music front, we've got an update here, courtesy of The Mirror, about Zayn Malik. Obviously, I covered it previously on my podcast about the story that he allegedly striked his mother-in-law or his supposed mother-in-law, because I don't think him and Gigi are married. But regardless, let's just say his mother-in-law for the you know extent of this show. Um, <laughs> what? John Ross's daughter, honey. John Ross, John Ro Jonathan Ross's daughter has got a black boyfriend. Interesting. Not that it matters, but, you know, it's just funny. Um, let's continue. So, Zay Malik, yep. Um, now it looks like it's got from bad to worse. As per usual with the industry pylon, once one person deems you to be unworkable with, right, suddenly the whole industry picks up their moral backbone and decides to kind of drop you as well, which is kind of heinous, I think, because for the most part, from the little that I know, having been in the entertainment industry, you know, from very, very far away, People know about how people are, right? They know people's personalities. They know their vices. They know what they get up to behind closed doors. Everyone knows everyone's business, right? So I don't believe for one minute that Zayn's kind of attitude, the way he goes on, how he is behind the scenes wasn't a known fact. But people tolerated it because it's Zayn. He's good for business. He's associated with this superstar model. He's associated with this obviously, you know, legendary sort of boy band in One Direction. Like they, they didn't mind all the negative press that came with him because the, the positive press outweighed it. Then as soon as the negative press starts to outweigh the positive press, they drop him like a hot potato. And I think, in my opinion, that it's just disgusting. Again, regardless of not condoning what he did to his alleged mother-in-law, it's just the idea that when like they kind of use you for your bad bad boy image or whatever it may be or your kind of uncontrollable image in the moment that gets too far where you know maybe police are involved maybe there's a lawsuit involved suddenly the record label decides to drop you and it's like what do you expect people to do after the fact what do you expect somebody who kind of has made their entire oh no who spent their entire adulthood singing into a microphone and that's how they pay the bills what do you want them to do next going forward yes some people say oh yeah he's got a rich family he'll be fine but I just don't necessarily see how this is constructed to anybody going forward. I really don't. Um, it's just courtesy of uh, the mirror. It says, Zelene, Zelene, <laughs> Zayn Malik ditched by record label due to being almost impossible to control. It says Zayn Malik is no longer signed to the US record label. RCA reports claim One Direction star who's been a solo artist since quitting his boy band group in 2015 was dropped a while ago due to British chart topping being uh, impossible to control. It says here a lot of people have been desperately, no, have tried desperately to get Zayn's life and career back on track, but nothing's worked. So many people have worked to him to get up um, and have just given up, a source told the sun. The mayor also contacted the representative of Zayn Malik Arsia to comment. It says it's impossible for him to control or guide. A while ago, his quality decided, it, he, or a while ago, his, quiet, his label quietly decided it was the end of the line for the relationship and now this. And again, I'm one of the rare people that actually listens to Zayn Malik's albums. I've, whenever they pop up on my feed, I just download them and just see what they're saying. And they're very hot and cold. There are some decent songs on there you can find. But for the most part, he's a garbage artist. Like, really, really bad. Um, super phones it in. I, I always had a feeling that he phoned it in, but it's good to kind of know from this sort of like little quote that he made, most definitely, definitely did phone it in because... If you remember him on One Direction, if you remember him on, is it the X Factor where the One Direction one got together? I think it was One Direction, X Factor. I remember watching that. And I remember he, there was a bit in that season of X Factor, wherever it was that they formed the band, where he basically went home. He wanted to go home anyway. So I think he left the building or he was outside, whatever it may be. And they had to beg him to come back, like beg and plead this guy. And he really didn't want to come back, right? And this was when One Direction was just forming. And they're like, no, you're the final piece of the jigsaw, uh, or, or the jigsaw, sorry. You know, you're this kind of racially ambiguous, Asian-y sort of not really looking guy. You sing amazing, girls love you. You're, you have to work in this thing. And eventually he did. And I'm sure it gave him a far, you know, it, get, it allowed him to have experiences he never had. He probably got some long-time friends from it. You know, whatever relationship, da, 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 he did well. But, 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 
he's always kind of struck me as somebody that's been a reluctant star, a reluctant celebrity. He's sort of similar to me, like, you know, those footballers who, who kind of don't like watching football, who don't even like talking about football outside of when they play the game, who just happen to be talented at this thing where they kick a, a bag of wind around, but they don't really like what they do. They just do it for a job and then as soon as it's time to retire, they kick and they never turn back sort of thing. That's what he kind of reminds me of. But I guess because of music, because it's so easy, not easy, because it's less strenuous than playing football, you kind of just keep hoping you're going to fall in love with it sooner rather than later. So you get in front of a mic, you get in front of a computer, you try and record stuff, and it just doesn't sound as good as you want it to sound because you're just not in it as much. It's the same thing when people get money. Do you know what I mean? It's the same, same sort of thing. When you get money or when you're a starving artist and people love you and then you get money, it is take, it does take some time for them to get used to this new you because you're not talking about roaches on the floor anymore. Now it's flipping, you know, fili mignon or whatever not. It continues. Um... Da, 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 da. Um, this week Zane pleaded guilty right in the, the, the court so we know what happened right um, so the question is do you reckon he's surprised do you honestly think he thought he was going to win a battle between his missus and, and her mum or did you think because I, I think my theory is that they probably bad mouth the mother together she's probably a complete nightmare a complete monster a bully whatever it may be right and they got to a point in their relationship where most likely Gigi said to Zane hey man you and my mom don't get along but I love you so what we're gonna do is that she's never gonna be allowed to come around here when I'm not here because when you guys left alone for a prolonged period of time you just end up shouting at each other and I don't like it you know dysfunctional family is probably not the most healthy relationship to have and if anything if that was my friend and Gigi was my friend I was you know what I mean I'll be like hey maybe break up with him and find someone else you are drop that gorgeous anyway you're gonna find somebody else to kind of be your stepdaddy I'm pretty sure but this isn't a healthy place to be um to have a kid kind of grow up in a household where the dad is flipping arguing with her grandmother it just doesn't make any sense but anyway I think that was the arrangement. And then, of course, as mums do, because that's her flipping grandchild, she's not going to be like, oh, I'm not going to... She doesn't want to have those rules on her. She wants to see her grandchild when she wants to see it. She was like, you know what? One day she thought, fuck it. I'm going to go there and, and give him a piece of my mind. She went over to their flat or wherever they were. I don't know how they encountered each other, but somehow they crossed paths. And then, of course, the argument happened. And then, you know, the rest is history. I think that's probably what ended up happening. And I think, again, Zayn probably miscalculated and thought... Because his missus talks about his her mum so badly that she would somehow could protect him or she would somehow have his back and it's like that's never gonna happen. You're never gonna split, you know, a daughter from her mother unless they're already broken beforehand. But usually if they have, if they kind of come from a you know, a smaller family, maybe a single parent family, those people those guys that might as well be sisters. Do you know what I mean? They're not even daughter, mother and daughter anymore. They're probably closer than that. Um if if there is a level closer than that. So he maybe just miscalculated overall. But I'm sure in the back of his mind, it also did feel really satisfying because he probably clearly hates her guts to the point. Because again, I can't think of a scenario that would put me in a position to be angry enough to push somebody, especially a girl, in that way. Especially somebody who happens to be the mother of somebody that I love. That just seems to be to be a nuts because what you're effectively doing by that push is that you're saying that I don't want to be in a relationship anymore. You're basically saying I want to be single because that's what that push does. You immediately be touch somebody like that you're definitely thinking in the back of your head that you want to be single. You don't necessarily want to be in a relationship. You don't. You don't. You probably don't even want your kid at that point. You're like, you know what? Just X me out. I'm gone. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what you're probably hoping to do. Um, and again, it didn't work out for him. But again, I, I just can't get with these record labels. I think they're two-faced. I think they want the bad boy. They want his attitude. They want all that stuff. And then the moment it goes left, the moment it's not palatable enough for them, they decide to jump ship and they decide to suddenly kind of pick up their moral backbone from the floor and decide to kind of insert it and then suddenly kind of make draw a line at him it's like because i remember reading another report that said oh zayman's been dropped because of his excessive weed use it's like what come on man come on as if you didn't know you were smoking before now suddenly it's too much to smoke like get out of here man but god damn it's a wrap for him it's a wrap for him there's really no way of coming back from this Unless him and Gigi do like a united front thing. They do what John Jones did with his missus. He got accused of domestic violence. 
there was that you know incident with him kind of you know banging on the police car, acting crazy and shit while he was getting cuffed. And then the only thing that kind of quelled or allowed people to move on because they're in a re- ridiculously toxic relationship was that John Jones took a little video on his Instagram, I think, with his kind of wife in the passenger seat, and they did some weird, long, you know, really wet kiss thing for the camera. And obviously that was their way of saying that, hey, we're cool now. Guys, you can leave us alone. Stop messaging us. Stop telling her that she should leave me. We're cool. You know, that sort of thing. Unless they do that, or unless Gigi does that for Zayn, it's done for him as a rap. It's a rap. This, this industry is too, you know, they're too afraid of being next to somebody who's kind of deemed to be um, ir- irredeemable that they won't do it. They just won't. They won't. And the kind of, again, the sensible thing to do, because he clearly has issues, whatever it is, I don't know what, don't ask me to psychoanalyze anybody, but they should be supporting him at this time, actually bringing him in to allow him to grow, to get better. Because again, the only thing this guy's known is singing. Has he ever, ever had a real job? I don't think so. Does he come from a family with money? Probably. I don't know. But there's going to come a point where he's going to be struggling to kind of get his feet off the ground and he's not going to see, see a way out apart from making music. And if he doesn't have that option, what else is he going to do? And if something bad happens off the back of that, who is culpable? Who is responsible for that? Who can take the blame? Will they just say it's his fault because he hit or he pushed his flipping mother-in-law? Or can you blame the industry for taking his entire career away for over something like this? It's just, I don't know. I don't know, man. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm overthinking it and it's not that real serious. But let me know in the comments what you think below. I'll be curious to hear your thoughts. Next we move on to my favorite topic, something that I wanted to talk about for ages. I told you, motherfuckers. I told you. I told you. I told you. I told you. Originally, I made this video or I made a clip. Well, no, I spoke about it on my podcast and I made a clip on my YouTube where I spoke about Gunner's outfit, right? The infamous outfit where he's wearing the Christian Dior sort of see-through monogram um, jumper with a Rick Owens. If it looks like zip up blazer thing, Rick Owens shorts, Rick Owens geo basket type things with no shoot, with no laces, um, just looking like a hot mess, right? But Everyone was taking a piss out of him for the outfit, taking a piss out of him for the weird pose. But I said at the time, you know what? I don't think the outfit is that bad. There's just components about it that don't really work or kind of rock with his sort of style and maybe his build. But the outfit isn't that bad. It's just maybe him. He just probably doesn't swag it out as much as he probably should. And the comments went off. Nah, the outfit's bad. You're bugging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever people are saying, right? Any people on social media, you know, people pretending to be stylists or pretending to have any good fashion sense themselves, right? Then look, then what happens? Then later on down the line, flipping Rihanna decides to be Gunner for Halloween, which is a flipping epic outfit, and absolutely kills it and looks 10 times better than he does, obviously, in the same outfit. But this is proof, like I said before, that Gunner's outfit wasn't that bad in the first place. It was just the way he was wearing it. Because maybe I'm too, maybe it's been all my years spent working in retail, all my years being an avid fashion streetwear fan, looking at many lookbooks, looking at many Vogue runway pictures or TV images. You know when something doesn't look quite right on somebody because of their build, because of the way it fits, because of maybe the fabrication, the styling, whatever, you can kind of recognize it. And you can also see some stuff that you'll see in another person and imagine how it might look on you. So that was the only, that's the only thing that I was doing. I was filtering it through my eyes. I was thinking, you know what, if I had this, maybe I wouldn't wear that Christian Dior jumper thing. Maybe I'd kind of, you know, dumb it down or not make it as high end as it is. I'd maybe take off all the chains and maybe maybe wear one. And again, swap it out for making a t-shirt so the chains are really showing, not showing the dark turtleneck. I'll do st- some some tiny things. Maybe the shorts that Rihanna's got on, on the left are a little bit better than the ones he's got on the right, look a bit too small, a little bit too tight. That's the only thing that I would do. Tiny, tiny little adjustments just to ensure that the outfit looks the way I want it to kind of look in my head. But everyone was just cussing, saying it doesn't look... Uh, uh, and then suddenly Rihanna wears it and everyone's kind of sharing their image everywhere. It's just, come on, man, you guys. But again, it also goes to show that sometimes be, being able to be like... What was it called? It's not clothes, but like a hanger. Whatever that word is called for people that wear clothes really well. It does go to show that some people just have the gift of whatever they put on just looks good. And Rihanna is just one of those people. Whatever she wears, street style wise, whatever she wears, kind of fashion, street, like again, she just ends up kind of looking absolutely impeccable. So yeah, big up Rihanna. Um, one of the greatest Halloween outfits of all time. Again, it's, it's good because I didn't really celebrate Halloween. I never do. Christian background, so it's kind of ingrained in me not to celebrate. It's a bit weird. But I didn't go out and do anything, but it's, it was quite interesting to see all these people, you know, put their outfits together and show them, obviously, across social media. Um, I'm not necessarily a fan of the celebrity stress-up thing. 
I never really got the idea about Halloween being an opportunity to dress up like somebody that's well known. I always thought the idea behind it was to dress up as somebody scary, but I guess it's a double entendre. You're dressing up as somebody well known because you think they're scary. That's what you're hoping for, I guess, but whatever. Um, Rihanna looks great. She looks amazing. She smashed that flipping outfit head to toe, as who is Celebrity Vice says here. And the winner is this is why she is the queen at Bad Girl Explains It All. When Fashion Victor went as Fashion Victim, it gets no better than this, folks. How to wear Rico into 101. But yeah, it's just little, t little subtle things, right? She's got the jumper tucked into the shorts. The shorts look a bit baggier than what Gunner's got on. Even the, even the flipping, whatever, what she called them. I think Rihanna called them the Gunners, actually. That was kind of stacked. Um, is it monolith? Whatever they are, um, Rick Owens, right? With the no laces. That's all it kind of needs. Again, take off the, take off the chains. Maybe take off the jumper for a t-shirt of some sort. Or maybe just even take off the jumper and just leave the vest on. Whatever, something just to kind of dumb it down slightly would have looked much better. But again, Rihanna's stepping forward, doing the way forward. She even braided the hair the same. Absolutely epic, man. She absolutely smashed that. I'm not going to lie. She absolutely smashed that. Okay. My camera's on focusing again. There we go. Let's move on. Bish bash bosh. Oh, let's go to this. Yeah, let's talk about this. Where is it? Uh, yeah, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. So let's talk about this because I thought it was amazing to see again. Iteration number two, it looks like, of a Cold Wars 1461 with Dr. Martins that they've made. Obviously, the first ones I featured here on my channel before, the Greys. I thought they might have been one of his kind of better collaborations overall. Maybe up there with that Air Force One with the minimal laces in them, with the with the two eyelets, sorry, in them, or four. Was it one one on the bottom, one on the top? I thought it might be up there with that in terms of how he was able to kind of reimagine a classic silhouette, elevate it to a point without it looking too pretentious and also make it somewhat functional, right? A shoe that you can want to kind of beat up and wear. And this brings me nicely onto this point of these shoes and the photos that have been used to kind of market them all over social media and stuff. And my kind of preface has always been, as I've said it many times on this show before, is that I have a real problem with sneaker product shots or footwear product shots in total, in totality. I think they're terrible, especially the ones that Hype Beast take or like Hype X and other places like that, where they take a picture of somebody with pin rolls or it looks like they're jumping somewhere, running on their toes, wacky socks on, just absolute garbage pictures. Or the one where they're stepping on water, it looks like on the SLR, doing it, you know, at really, you know, slow. Was it slow frame per second to kind of catch all the light and make it look like he's splashing? All the really annoying, cringy photos. And they don't necessarily give you an end any kind of oomph for really longing or desire to grab that shoe it's just kind of meh but the one thing i've kind of give credit to samuel ross and what he's done with his collaborations when it comes to footwear is that he's kind of elevated the photography a bit it looks fresher it just looks far more interesting um it looks like something that you'd instantly want to wear and pick up yourself you want to investigate it. You want to find out what materials were used, why it looks the way it does, why the sole is translucent. All these little things you want to pick up on because of how somebody has worn it. And I think in general that some of these kind of product shots, especially the ones that they're taking, they do such a good job in order to kind of get people to actually buy the shoe. That is also making me think to myself, there is a real strength in being able to display a shoe like this, brand new, like this 1461. Look how classic that looks. You know, you see the classic Dr. Martin sort of um, stitching there on the sole. you got the translucent clear eye sole, which I've never really seen in the Dr. Martin. Again, I used to work for Dr. Martin for many years in the stores and stuff. Um, I went up to even being a flipping, what was I? Supervisor at one point, which is kind of the level above assist, level below assistant manager. I got a one pound raise off that. That was fucking hilarious, right? They made a big deal out of me getting this promotion, um, battling with some somebody else in the team who I ended up in, who I ended up falling out with uh because of this fucking stupid war to get that um sub supervisor role only for me to get it and be terrible as a supervisor I was fucking garbage at it garbage at being a supervisor I could not be a supervisor in a retail store I was just too shit um too friendly with everybody um wanting to always have a laugh too distracted couldn't cash out to save my life cashing up man oh my god I, it used to take me hours to cash up in the till so much so that the till was always off by like a couple of pounds or something and it was never because i was taking money out of the till always because i couldn't count properly next day a manager will come in and correct it and find out oh yeah there was 10 pound underneath a shoe that i forgot to count or just something stupid like that i was just terrible at their job anyway regardless i've never seen a translucent sort of that icy soul so for them to take that and do it on this sort of model um have the sort of 
concealed hidden laces um eyelet things on the top the little um snap buttons what would you call them emboss buttons here on the side the iconography of a cold wall there on the side as well just beautiful i would have liked to have seen this sort of logo done in some sort of metal maybe like a badge that kind of hangs off of it maybe that's a bit too much to ox for maybe it would have maybe raised the price overall i like the fact that they've got a little pull tab there made out of leather on the back but that would have been great to have like a little tag here that was kind of made out of some metal some sort of chrome they could have put on the outside but regardless they're going to be thinking, right? These product shots, clean, clear, brand new, looks amazing. Then you go into Sammy Ross's Instagram itself and him kind of showcasing the shoes in his studio and the actual pairs that I think he's got, right? The, maybe the wear testing pair that he had in order to make sure they're perfect. And look how great they look as studio kicks, right? Those are his studio kicks he's been wearing maybe on a daily basis. But that and in combination with the other pictures I've shown you from Hypebeast itself, those instantly want you to buy the shoe. It instantly makes you want to buy the shoe because now you've seen how it looks after a couple of wears, maybe some convenient sort of splatters here on the front to make them look like Margellas or to make them look like you're in the studio working because, again, I worked in Dr. Martins. I've worn a lot of Dr. Martins. I can't think of more... I can't think of a more uncomfortable shoe to wear day to day than a Dr. Martin personally, especially in a studio. Unless until you've broken them in. Once you break them in, they're like flipping sandals. But it takes a long time to break in a pair of Dr. Martins. I can't imagine how how tough it must be to have those freaking bricks in your feet. And um sizing wise too i don't know why about the sole maybe is there like an elastic elastic on it to keep the tongue in i wonder if you could wear these without the laces and just kind of keep them like that probably can anyway regardless going back to the point i think these product shots really give um the shoe a whole different feel they help to elevate it one bit help to give you a context of how it looks in real life and they do a far better job at selling the shoe than these sort of over stylized weird kind of shitty sneaker pictures that most of these sites take where somebody's wearing pin rolls and funky socks i mean it's just garbage it's really trite i much prefer this sort of stuff in my opinion when it comes to the sneaker shots and again big up them for doing a good job um in doing so it looks like for the most part they've given samuel ross creative control in order to kind of put out some of the promotional materials for this sort of stuff and it shows because the uh, images are really 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 good you don't see those kind of corny dr martin images that they always do where there's some kids sitting on top of a flipping phone box do you know what i mean with his feet dangling down and him showing some d double double stacked martins it's like it's a bit boring but i love these i think these are really well done if anything i would have preferred to have seen them on a 1460 i think this model that shape um the way the laces are concealed it being in a 1460 which is the one with what is that 12 holes whatever the one i have right the kind of classic boot that would have looked flipping epic that would have been up there with that vetema dr martin's or that vetema dr martin's type shoe that was classic back in the day that had the borderline at the back Do you remember that one the one with the no laces yeah that would have been up there with that kind of level but yeah really amazing great collaboration um when are they due to come out actually let's read the actual article because i haven't seen the article here itself it says hype beast the home center of cold war and the british uh, footwear brand dr martins are back for a third time this time giving the 1461 silhouette that it dropped in graphite back in august in the black makeover it feels like all these collaborations are like that right they rarely ever make a collaboration where there's only one colorway it feels like all these brands sort of like hope when they do these collaborations that you're going to sell out you're going to be able to get loads of free press. You're going to be able to maybe fan, make, make some new fans. You're going to be able to create a little moment, put it in your kind of marketing deck for other promotional materials or other deals that you want to do in the future. Because that's what basically they use them as, right? A bit of leverage um, to have all these kind of crazy designers and people collaborating on your brand, hopefully use that to then leverage to get other deals going forward. So it is interesting to think about that sort of shit um, and also to think about the fees that they're paying people. Like it's probably not enough the amount of money these guys are getting to these collaborations because they do give them a lot of life, but again it's a mutually beneficial um collab because on the back of it a cold war gets to work with dr martin you get to make really high quality shoes you get to kind of learn their processes and manufacturing and whatnot and insights and whatnot that you can kind of take into your own stuff and it also allows you to kind of be aligned with a historic um brand right legendary uk brand footwear brand in that, in that respect um that can obviously help you in the future too to kind of parlay that stuff into other um brand deals for yourself it continues it says here in many ways the up and coming pair is like a combination of the 1460 that first released in july 2020 and the aforementioned 1461 um the bex graphite it features in spit folded tongue. hold on they did a 1460 when did they do a 1460 i don't remember that they did a 1460 already so that, that's the boot i was talking about the classic boot when did they do this they did a 1460 i don't remember this at all 
in 2020 last year look time has gone by in a blur man they put this out during the pandemic so that's probably why i didn't i wasn't paying attention i'm gonna be honest and say maybe that's why i wasn't paying attention but i didn't know they did a 1460 my bad i completely missed that one let's see if my computer can load in time so you can see what these 1460s look like it's still loading oh yeah i remember they did do them yeah okay cool they did them already i already said they would look amazing in a color. okay cool but i would prefer them in the same color with the transition saw but these are still pretty amazing okay yeah they did do a 1460 my bad it was the first collaboration that sold out in an instant as well again very very well done collaborations you have to be honest man super super good um the graphite pair only came okay only came with a zipper this one doesn't however the tongue section is locked um with a super um is, is locked to the upper using metal rivets and the heavy presence of top stitching the elements such as the awe bracket logo also appear on the shoot upper yeah this time around is printed onto the middle panel rather than being stamped on the rear quarter like the former 461 but still i would have liked it's like a metal emblem that would have been sick um rounding out the shoe design is a sole unit that is quintessentially dr martin's appearing in a semi-translucent clear rubber sole the ribbed airway um equipped piece is contrasted with a brand's iconic yellow double welt stitching yo that sole reminds me do you remember those classic rebook workouts with kind of, kind of the icy sole i think why was kind of famous for wearing them imagine you did the colorway similar to that of those rebooks so you kind of got them in like a white with like a red translucent sole a blue translucent sole oh they would look so tough like so 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 tough um but again 1461s are the type of shoe where they the 1461 for me especially because again i always used to wear 1460s um or Jaden's, the classic double sole shoes they were always similar to like Stan Smith's for me. Stan Smith's and Converse's always look amazing on other people. But as soon as I put them on, they look like absolute dog shit. I don't know what it is about me, my foot, my build that just doesn't look good in 1461s. But whenever someone else wears a 1461, they look great. And on me, they just don't look that great. And I don't know what it is. It's not like a skinny fat thing because I've seen plenty of bigger dudes, way bigger than I am, who wear kind of car heart stuff and big baggy trousers who wear 1461s and they look amazing on them. But whenever I put them on, they just didn't sit right with me just didn't kind of you know didn't really fit my my steez my swag whatever you want to call it so yeah big up them when did you to come out due to come out it looks like on november the 4th oh okay so they're so they're out already so it should be out very very soon so definitely go check them out if you haven't already um they're going to be priced at 230 dollars so not cheap but again with a dr martin you're going to have them for life basically if you look after them well enough um they're pretty great shoes you can replace the sole obviously not with a translucent maybe but you can replace the sole you can repair it pretty easily at most cobblers sometimes if you're nice i don't know what the deal is now but remember back then when i used to work there if you're nice enough they would maybe offer to repair them for you for free in store or maybe for a small fee or nominal fee but regardless um great collaboration from cold war um again and a, a, a perfect congruent collaboration if ever there was one a perfect congruent collaboration next to kind of end it i say we've got news here courtesy of supreme about a junior watanabe um com de garçon collaboration um cod muscle man sorry collaboration with supreme and again just another reminder of the power of supreme and why they can just never be forgotten about especially in the era that we're living in now where it looks like stussy are taking over that our legacy collaboration was absolutely amazing you've got um amelie leon door look doing great stuff you've got uh what's the other brands called doing noah maybe doing some good stuff but they kind of looks like they've fallen off a little bit but there's many a good brands out there loads of flipping nondescript sort of south korean brands that are doing absolute business out there but people always kind of discount supreme from time to time but what they do really well they sometimes do smack you over the head with a collab or with a collection they just remind you that there are real levels to this shit it's just this levels it's not fair um it's not right it's not okay but it's just levels to this shit and they're just on another level and this collaboration i think loads of the pieces i saw like a little meme going around with an infographic showing all the journey what's not break um, collaborations or sorry runway pieces from you know over the years that this collection is referencing but regardless if you didn't know the references just from a pure pieces and clothing point of view 
this is fucking hard. Like, it's really, really good. Um, this is a blurb, courtesy of Supreme, because they write some of the best blurb. It says here, fashion designer Junior Watanabe was born in 1961 in Fukushima, Japan. He attended the Bunker Fashion College in Tokyo and began pattern making an apprenticeship at Comte des Garçons shortly after graduating in 1984. Watanabe went on to design Treco um, Comte des Garçons before debuting his opinions label in 1992. Watanabe is widely regarded as one of the innovative approach of construction and shape across unexpected range of materials. Watanabe often experiments with synthetic and industrial textiles. His four winter 2016 collections featured solar tech trench wear, da, 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 yet he also reimagines everyday staples. This Four Supreme has worked on the collection inspired by Junior Watanabe's Comte de Garçon archive. The collection consists of Scott jackets, da, 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 available on the 4th and in Japan from the 6th. And just from that thumbnail alone, that patchwork jacket and the matching flipping pants you already know it's going to be lit you already know what situation is going to be you already know it's going to be get your wallets out close your eyes tap in your flipping security code and your expiry date and let's get it cracking in it that's what you already know what time it is man this collection is so 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 hard so yeah you've got this patchwork jacket that is obviously one of the standouts obviously in the entire collection that's going to sell out like absolute hotcakes um that jacket just looks fucking wild you got the leather jacket here. Um, it looks like leather Scott, maybe Scott jacket here, right? Double breasted sort of jacket. Classic, again, classic Supreme. When they do this stuff right, they do it absolutely right. Come on, let's go to the next one. My computer's going so slow. <sighs> oh. Again, you've got a nice tartan sort of members only jacket, you know, members only um work jacket sort of vibe. Again, what Supreme do really well with the text written on it. There's one thing that you know about Japanese brands, they love a good sentence um paragraph of text on a jacket or on a piece of clothing on a t-shirt or whatnot sometimes it's just like straight up whatever they kind of translate from japanese to english it just makes no sense or sometimes it's just gonna be something kind of you know ephemeral that they kind of picked up from a book somewhere but japanese brands love it i love that sort of shit man that, that's stuff i grew up on looking at those kind of pieces in flipping street magazines from back in the day but yeah it looks absolutely great man let's not deny it. look at that those patchwork bottoms that jumper like oh yeah 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 so many nice pieces and everything that they're stocking here, man. Cannot wait for this stuff to drop. It's obviously going to sell out. I'm going to attempt to buy it. Not going to get anything. That shirt. That Junior Watanabe. Like, you know those classics Comme des Garçons shirts, right? That sit amazing. Um, That you button up all the way to the top. That usually have a button that kind of stops maybe at the belly button. So that when you walk, it sort of flays and shows a bit of skin. Great materialing, right? I've still got one of them original Comme des Garçons H&M collection shirts from back in the day. I've still got a couple. Oh, no, actually, I do it. I have a couple Comme des Garçons shirt um, that I also bought from the Dover Street Market sale. Remember those Dover Street Market sales they used to have back in the day? Those are amazing. I bought from them, but they're great shirts, right? They elevate your outfits like to another level. Really, really, really great. Um, I might have actually discovered them, oddly enough, through... What was that flipping? There was this modelling show, right? back in the day of this model agency in the uk um i think it was a model agency. yeah it must have been a model agency. and there was this one guy that worked there who had great swag he used to kind of wear comp de gosh shirts uh big white trousers and like clark um clark's desert boots it looks like i think desert boots right um and he used to kind of wear that yeah with the comp de gosh shirt big trousers and clark desert boots he used to always kind of make them look great and i remember seeing those shirts on him first and then maybe seeing dixon wearing them later the dj and then thinking oh where the who makes those shirts and then kind of discovering comp de gosh and getting through that whole thing because at first i didn't know that it, it was a line that was called comp de gosh shirt i just assumed it was comp de gosh shirt like a like a shirt but you have to kind of figure out later on that's what the actual line itself is called but yeah um absolutely incredible man so 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 good uh, everything here has looks so wearable looks instantly coppable looks cozy as fuck great shirts the, the, that backpack is gonna be an abs that backpack is gonna be a runaway hit too i don't know a lot of people don't kind of geek out on supreme backpacks like i did back in the day i've still got a pretty decent collection of, of them at the moment maybe i've got four left from over the years that i've purchased but the supreme backpacks over the years have been really really good man um so yeah that's going to be a definitely a standout hit but we already know what's going to sell out the most we already know what people are going to be buying the most it's definitely going to be this patchwork puffy jacket that just looks fucking wild you know it looks like a little bit low it looks like that brand ready made that makes kind of like um that kind of gets repurp or do they do they is it ready made actually getting vintage garments or materials and kind of reconstructing them or is that just kind of patchwork stuff that's just dip dyed in green 
to make it look like it's been one in the army or something but regardless this jacket is going to be an absolute hit people are going to be all over this the washed out look supreme and junior watanabe badge on the front just to kind of elevate it do you know what I mean? it's not just basic supreme it's junior watanabe man supreme do you know what i mean just need to see the levels obviously the best colors in green i think it comes in black too doesn't it the black is a pretty decent color because the patches are going to be slightly off color as well so you're going to look really good in the black as i think is it black oh no the black's not okay I thought the black would be a little bit more of um, this color than than this because it just does look quite totally black from afar. You can't really see anything. I don't really like that S at the bottom there, the corner. But, you know, Supreme are always going to whack their logo on most of their clothing now. I just have to accept it nowadays. It's just it is what they do as a brand. That kind of days of having just a subtle little branding or the little kind of um, pull tab or the little kind of, you know, that little folded woven label they would have where you just can't even make out the text. It just looks red and you know what it is. And the heads nod. They don't do that anymore. Now they're just a company that kind of displays the, the logo on the right side of the sleeve. You just have to kind of, you know, the jackets, are, the, the clothing's so good. I'm willing to put up with branding. Now that, that's the same. That's how Bape was back in the day. Bape would put like Bape in front of a of hoodie or whatever. But the the hoodies were so good looking that you just do it anyway. I remember they started doing the, the real test was shark hoodies. When they started to put Bape in front of the shark hoodies, that really tested your flipping loyalty to Bape because if you know these, these hoodies are so good, they're so cozy, so comfortable, they drop so well that I'm willing to kind of put up with this massive logo on the front, and everyone will know that I didn't get the better one without the logo. Da, 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 da. But yeah, I love it, man. This puffy jacket, the patchwork stuff looks amazing. It all looks really great. I'm not going to go through the entire collection, so don't um, get too nervous. But it does look really, 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 really good. And I'm sure it's all going to sell out in kind of record time. Everyone's going to want to buy this sort of stuff. And yeah, this is what we're going to resell for many, many bucks. Oh, Gore-Tex. Wow, this is a Gore-Tex denim pullover. Wow, man, well, how do you make a denim pullover that's Gore-Tex? That's that. That's some pretty futuristic, forward-thinking manufacturing practices, isn't it? And then this printed work jacket is also going to be a bit of a sleeper hit, I think, too. Um, oh, it comes in that hot pink. Oof. I think the patchwork version is probably the best, but that hot pink colorway is really good, isn't it? That's a that's a definitely that's a good Shoreditch winner. If you want a jacket to kind of you know peacock yourself out if you're in Shoreditch drinking some beers outside of some trendy pub with your little what loafers on with your white socks and your trousers pulled up high that pink jacket might be the one do you know what I mean pop into Jaguar shoes have a little of a boogie pretend to know what you're listening to pull some birds do some cat in the toilet that pink one will probably do get you a long way into kind of getting in that lane I think so but yeah Trini Watanabe with Supreme coming to you very soon. That Mario Jumper ended there. I don't want to see the whole thing because it's a bit boring to see it. But yeah, you can check it out. Available at supreme.com forward slash news. Check it out there. All the links are available. You know where to find all that stuff. Let me focus the camera again because it's being dumb. There we go. There we go. Anyway, that is the Action Zing Show episode number 514. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. Um, I'll see you again very, guys, very, very soon. Until then, take care, be safe. Of course, as usual, if you like the show, five, you know, five stars on the old podcast apps or two or three, I don't mind. Um, share the show, click like below, subscribe, all that good stuff if you enjoyed it. If I earned your if I earned your subscription, of course, click subscribe. If I earned your rating, also rate the show, and I'll be very, very grateful for that. But until then, I'll see you guys again very soon. Take care, peace.